Can you see it? Aren't we like that sometimes? Where we can't see God working in the little or even the big things, we always want something more. He is working in your life in the little things and the big things to bless you so you can be a blessing. But you don't see it. There's no doubt we're blessed by the Lord. We are blessed in many ways, and yet sometimes we assume the blessings that we have are things we've earned, things that we deserve, things that we've done for ourselves. We expect certain things in this in this culture we live in. In West Kanky County, in, in North Central Illinois, we expect to have nice homes, beautiful cars, good schools, winning football teams, right? We expect to even have better weather. We expect all these things assuming that we deserve them. We naturally assume we deserve good health. We naturally assume we deserve safety and freedom. We think we deserve these things when really they're blessings of God's gracious gifts to us all. And we take them for granted. And we look to God and say, God, show me the next big thing. I want to see something amazing. When God has done the most amazing thing he's ever done in sending his son Jesus Christ to save us so we can live with him forever. Amen. God, show us the next big thing. Can you see it? It's already here. We're so blessed, but we take it for granted. For example, if you've got clothes on, and I I believe most of you do, and that's a good thing. If you've got clothes on your back, a roof over your head so you didn't get wet yesterday or last night or this morning, and you've got a nice place to sleep, and you've got some type of change somewhere in your house or your car, and any money in the bank at all, you are in the top 8% of the most blessed people in the world. Think about that. Clothes, a house, some spare change and money in the bank, even if it's $1, most of us qualify for that, we're in the top 8%. It's amazing we're blessed. And yet we're like, God, show me something else. Because we're able to attend worship in a place like this where we're not threatened to death, we're not uh, persecuted at every turn, Since we're here today, I want you to know you're more blessed than some 3 billion people in the world. Because there's 3 billion people, if they come to a place like this to celebrate Christ, they could die today or be put in prison. Aren't we blessed? 3 billion people have it worse than us in their ability to worship. Can you see it? Oftentimes we can't. That's why over the next four weeks we're going to start this sermon series. It's called Blessed to be a Blessing. And it's not only enough to realize we're blessed and then worship. You did a great job today. Worship was was great. Uh, give Dustin a hand. In the midst of a sickness, he uh, continued for Christ. Let's praise God for that. But it's not enough to say, hey, we're blessed. We're going to worship you. We're going to celebrate you. It God is calling us to be so blessed that we can't help be a blessing to others and in turn give him glory time and time again. This is not my theory. This is from the word of God. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you can grab a Bible underneath your chair, maybe you didn't bring one, it's going to be on page 807. And we're going to see this concept, and it's going to be the theme for the next four weeks, that we are blessed to bless others, and in turn, bring thanksgiving and glory to God. When we live such lives that we allow God's blessing in us to bring thanks to Him, we start to live His purpose in our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting with verse 8, it says this, God is able to bless you abundantly. Isn't that so true? God has the ability to bless you abundantly. Not just enough where you survive. He can bless you with more than you can imagine. I do not live this way in every aspect of my life, but there are places where I've just been blessed abundantly. With four boys. With a loving family. With with a great church. God has blessed me abundantly. Not always with necessarily health or or, uh, knowledge as far as educationally or wisdom. But he can do all those things, but we do, we believe it. God is able to bless us abundantly, and let's see why. So that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Here's the key point right here. God doesn't bless us abundantly so we can sit back and say, boy, I'm blessed. Man, do I have it good. God bless me. God says he blesses us in all things, in all ways, at all times, abundantly, so that we can be about his work, about his ministry, about doing his business. Look down to verse 12. Skip a few verses. We can go back to there later this month. But it says this. This service or this ministry or this work that you perform 
is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but also is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Here's the beautiful part. When we're blessed and we put it to work for God and we're committed to His purpose and ministry, it in turn produces thanksgiving in His glory. Are you doing that? Can you see that? We need to live such blessed lives that we pour out an overflow of our abundance to bless others where people say, praise God for that church. Praise God for that family. Praise God that I know that person, they've led me to Jesus. Do you live that type of blessed life? Or are you just getting by? God wants us to have life to the full. Uh, Bob Moss told us a long time ago, this is this concept that Jesus came to give life to the fullest. It's called Zoe, an abundant life. And he wants to continue to give us this abundance so we're a blessing to others. First, excuse me, John chapter 1, verse 16. It's on the front of your program today. I chose to, to share that with you from a, a version most of you don't have in your hands, from the NIRV, the New International Reader's Version. It, this version of the Bible it is, a, is a good version of the Bible, but it was written for like 8, 9, and 10-year-olds so they can understand it. And sometimes that's right where I'm at. Because if you look at like uh, the ESV and, and the New American Standard and even the NIV, it talks about like grace on grace. It says God is able to pour out grace on grace. Here's the way the NIRV puts it. We have all received one blessing after another. God's grace is not limited. Some of the versions would say God pours out grace on grace. And the concept in the original Greek would be this. He pours out grace on top of grace, on top of grace, on top of grace. And the point is it's not limited. It's never ending. I want you to understand today God's grace is not limited. There is no limitation to God's grace. So no matter how destitute you are, no matter how depressed you are, no matter how void your life is, you can say, Tyson, I'm not in the top 8%. I'm really, I'm barely half. I don't don't have a house. It's got leaky roofs. I don't have any food. I'm destitute. God's grace is sufficient to meet your needs. You might say, Tyson, my life is so full of sin. I've sinned tremendously for the past 50 years. God's grace is not limited by that sin. God's grace can cover over that sin through Jesus Christ. It's grace on grace. The blessings of God we receive are his gift. And the Bible said, the passage I I read at the beginning of worship says, we can't boast about it. We just can receive it freely. But sometimes in the American culture, we like to think this, I've earned it. The things I have, I know what the Bible says, but the things I have, the money in my bank, the house I have, the clothes I have, the things you talked about to put me in the top 8%, it didn't come from God, I earned it. You're wrong. They are a gift from God. You're like, but Tyson, I've worked for it. I went to school. I've got a good job. I work hard at whatever I do. Yeah, but who gave you your life? Who gave you your health? Who provided you with the opportunity to have this blessing that you've worked hard for to be, become more blessed? It's God. It is from God. Do you see it? Everything in life is, that we have that's good is a blessing from above. James 1 says this. Every good and perfect gift is from above. God wants your life to be blessed. He wants your life to be so blessed that you can bless others and then bring thanksgiving and glory to Him. So how do you put your life in a position to be blessed? Some of you are asking that stuff. Tyson, this is the best sermon I've heard you preach in five years. Because a lot of times you're thinking, you talk about going through hardships and you talk about persecution. You talk about buckling down and doing the right things even when it hurts. I like this idea of being blessed, right? Because if we ask the world, who is in favor of receiving a blessing from God, I would say 99% of you would raise your hands. I like being blessed. I like receiving gifts. God wants to do that. So how do you do it? This is a good sermon to pay attention to. The truth is, God wants to bless your life. But do you see it? It starts with Jesus. It's that simple. Point number one is this, to receive a blessing from God, we must receive God's blessings through Christ. Some of you are struggling in life, and you pursue blessings, you pursue good things, but you're doing them on their own, and they're good for like five seconds to maybe five days or maybe a couple years, and then you're left empty and you're left wanting more. If you pursue blessings in life, and they will come at times, sometimes they come from Satan himself, he'll entice us into feeling like we're blessed, and then all of a sudden we feel like we're at rock bottom because that's what he wants us to do. We need to understand that true blessings that will last for an eternity only come from Christ. Everything God does for you, through you, and with you, and in you is because of Jesus. 
Not because you're a good girl or a good guy. It's because of Jesus in you. He does it because of his son working in your life. The Bible explains time and time again that the blessings of life, even the origins of our creations, are held together by the author and creator, the sustainer of life, Jesus. He is supreme in all creation. Look at on the screen behind me in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing, in Christ. Every spiritual blessing that you have that's a true blessing, that is a blessing that is eternal, is in Christ. You say, that's kind of hard for me to understand. That's what the Word of God says. That it's in Christ is when we'll truly be blessed. Have you received Him then? Have you accepted the source of eternal life, the source of all true spiritual blessings? Have you received Him as your Savior? I know some of you haven't. I don't know all your names, but I just know in a room like this, there's someone who said, I'm trying to get blessed in life. I'm trying to just make it through life and survive, and I think I can do it on my own. There's going to be a day where you realize that's not true. It may be the day you die, or it may be today, and you're like, you submit to God and say, I'm ready to follow Jesus and be blessed by him. It's in Christ that we'll truly be blessed. Some of you are thinking, though, I'm ready for this, Tyson. It's time for me to be blessed. I've been struggling. Uh, it's struggle for me to have a roof over my head and, and food for my kids, and I don't have any of the money in the bank. I'm exactly what you're talking about. I'm struggling. I'm ready for a blessing. I'm just waiting on God to give it to me. I'm waiting on His time. Well, the wrong person's waiting because I'm convinced through Scripture that it's, it's not us that should be waiting on God. I believe God is waiting on us to receive Jesus because He's already provided the way. Look at Romans 5, chapter chapter 5, verses 6, 7, and 8. We talk about timing. While I'm waiting on God for a blessing, God's greatest blessing is upon you. Will you receive it? It says this. You see that at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if you're caught up in thinking, I'm waiting on God for a blessing, no, the timing is all about you receiving the blessing in Jesus and then things go well from there. The Bible says at just the right time, some 2,000 years ago, he sent Jesus to die for us. God's got the timing down, but you can't see it sometimes. God is ready for you to receive salvation through Jesus and be blessed more than you can imagine. He's took, taken the first step. It's up to you to take the next step and accept his son as your savior. Some of you are hearing this concept maybe for the first time. But it's so true. The timing is right for today for you to receive Jesus and be blessed. I want you to also know this about God's desire for a relationship with you. We need to understand that God made you. He loves you. And he wants to spend eternity with you. Some of you are like, I know this. We must, we must make this clear to everyone as we start this series of being blessed. God has designed you to be blessed by Him, but we haven't known God. Sometimes we resist that we're created by Him. And I would say, without a shadow of a doubt, if you're not accepting Jesus as your Savior, you're not ready for an eternity with Him. Because without Jesus, you have sin in your life. And with sin, eternity is going to be away from Jesus and God in hell. But with Him, you can have the hope of eternity in heaven. So many times we've tried to go through life and bless ourselves and it leads us to no blessing at all. But it's because of Jesus we can have this eternal life. Maybe you've been living for yourself for a while now and, and this sermon is at the perfect time through the Holy Spirit and through God's Word. You're saying, Tyson, I am tired of no blessings in my life. I'm tired of, of looking for the next like good thing to do on the weekend. I'm tired for trying to make it through on my own and just getting by. I'm ready to truly have peace and blessing. Then you need to come to Jesus. Why don't you start doing that this morning? Start by acknowledging to God that you believe that Jesus is his son. And you believe that God sent him from heaven and he died on the cross and he came back to life three days later and he still lives. We need to start by saying, God, I believe in your son Jesus. And then the word of God says, when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, 
you will be saved. There's something special about believing and confessing. Maybe today is your first day to say, I want to say with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of living God. The Bible also goes on to say that, that when, we're, when, we're, when we're turning from our old ways, trying to be blessed in our own ways, and we're doing things that go against God's will, and we know it's against God's will, what do we call that? And we do them time and time again? Sin. When you want to be blessed and you're in sin, the Bible says you must turn from it. And the, the theological word for that is not hard. It's repent. We must say we're sorry, God. I want to change. I want to turn from my old way and be blessed by you through Jesus. So let me ask you this morning. Have you received Jesus? Do you believe in him? Have you confessed him as your savior? Have you repented? And the Bible says once we repent and we believe, those who follow Jesus will be baptized. And the Bible promises that our sins will be washed away and we'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is no greater blessing that I've experienced in life than to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're trying to get through life and you do it on your own and without the Holy Spirit, without God living in you, it's a burdensome. But with the Holy Spirit, you can do anything more than you could imagine. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Once you do, the next thing we need to do to continue to receive blessings according to God's word is celebrate that. Celebrate God's blessings and worship. The overarching thought here is that came to me this week is have an attitude of gratitude. Live a life that appreciates what God's done. And then what's cool is when you appreciate what God's done, you say, this is good. God, thank you for this. And you don't go to him on the video and say, God, hey, what's next? What's the next big thing? Thank him for the water. Thank him for the 20 bucks that shows up in your life uh, out of nowhere. Thank him for those things. Have an attitude of gratitude. And then you know what happens? The blessings seem to flow quicker and quicker. But when when you're like my boys to their father, and I'm their father, so I know this, and you don't have this attitude of gratitude, I notice my heart says, okay, boys, you got what you're going to get. And that's all. Just yesterday, we were at McDonald's before uh, two football games in Gibson City. And I had my four boys and a couple other boys that were wanting to go to McDonald's. I mean, you say you're going to McDonald's at a football game with like 20 boys. The van was full. So we're at McDonald's and they were all hungry. So I bought them an appropriate amount of food. Let's just say that based on the money I had. (laughs) They all had either a cheeseburger or nuggets or something or McChicken. They all had fries. But I said, we're going to all drink water today, boys. And one of the little boys that's not in our family sat down. He goes, I got to have pop. I'm like, no, you don't have to have pop. You're going to, you're going to, you can drink, you can eat your food and you can drink water. We're going to be fine. This lack of attitude of gratitude spread from this boy to one of, to Declan. I'll go ahead and say his name. Declan says, dad, I know I I said I wanted a cheeseburger, but now I want McNuggets. I'm like, you're going to eat what I bought you. And that's all you're going to get because you're, you're complaining before you've even ate one French fry, before you've taken a bite of your sandwich, you're wanting something else. It's just like the movie. Show me the next best thing. But you know what happened? They all ate all their food. And I could tell they were still hungry. So without asking, I went and got more food. And as their father, I put that food in front of them because they had used what I had offered them and they had changed their attitude. They were just enjoying life. And I, I know I'm not a perfect father and this is not a perfect illustration, but I found much the same way. Whenever I'm content with what I have and I'm using what I have, and I'm enjoying what I have, God pours on more blessings, doesn't he? But when we're like, oh, woe is me, my life just stays oftentimes in a rut. We need to be in a position to celebrate God's blessings. And the greatest blessing is this again. When you feel like, okay, you can't even afford McDonald's, and there's times like that. When when you can't make it through the day because your health is failing, when your relationship with your spouse is so bad you don't know if you'll be able to talk when he gets home or she gets home from work, focus on this greatest blessing and it will take you back to a point of rejoicing. In Romans chapter 5, verse 11, it says this, We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Paul here, uh, other places in Scripture says, I say rejoice, and again I say rejoice. And, and here he's saying rejoice in this main, this one main reason that in Christ, when we were once on our own and, and destined to hell, we have been reconciled to him through Jesus, and that is why we rejoice. So in your worst of worst days, go back to this passage and be reminded that God has paid the price so you can live, and that should be enough to rejoice. Because I know things are tough. 
when Jesus died on the cross, he took care of our biggest problem. I came, came up with this this week. You know how there's like three letter, uh, three letter like uh, acronyms or whatever for just about everything anywhere anymore. And I'm way behind on this. Uh, I've just started texting like two years ago. And you guys know I like Facebook if you're on Facebook. I use that for God, hopefully. Uh, but I, I didn't know even what LOL was like two years ago. I'm way behind the curve on this type of stuff. But I came up with this acronym, EDP. And it is this idea of eternal destination problem. And we all had it. You're, you have an eternal destination problem when you're living on your own, uh, uh, outside of God's will. Your eternal destination is headed towards hell. But in Christ, God took care of our EDP. Because now our destination is heaven bound because he loves us so much. And here's the concept that Paul wants. I want us to understand what Paul's talking about here. He says, if God was able to take care of your EDP, can't he also take care of every other problem that you have? If God can take care of your EDP and change your destination from hell to heaven, he can take care of your finances. He can take care of your, your, your relationships at home. He can take care of your cancer. He can take care of anything the world throws at him because he's got that much power and he loves us that much. Can you see it though? Do you believe it? Here's the way Paul says it in Romans 8. Since God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Here's what Paul's saying. If God did not withhold his son to change your EDP, don't even doubt for a second that he can't change the other things you need. The scripture that we talked about today says he'll provide all things at all times in every way. In three ways, he says he can take care of it. Do we believe it, though? And when he does, we need to rejoice and expect it to happen. The answer is yes, God can take care of our needs. So after we receive Christ and we celebrate Christ, his blessings, we need to continue to do the third thing. Expect God's blessings to continue by faith. When you receive Christ and you worship him, we need to continue to say, God, I believe you're going to continue to bless us so we can be a blessing for your glory. This church has been blessed so much. We've talked about it in recent leadership. Um, It wasn't that long ago that this church was uh, worshiping over in that little room over there. And we were in pews and we were wondering if we'd ever see guests. And then when a guest would come, like a, a new person would come. Like all 40 to 50 people would smother that person to the point where they're like, let me have some air. And then we'd never see them again. There were days like that. We, we were wondering, God, how are you going to bless us, bring more people to us? Because our mission was to share God's love with all people everywhere. He's been blessing us. Sometimes we ask when things get awkward or weird, is he going to continue to do it? Paul says absolutely yes, if you continue to put those blessings to work for him for his glory. Can you see it? Some of you may be thinking, Tyson, you're starting to sound like a health and wealth gospel preacher. No. I want to preach God's word because God wants you to be blessed so you can bless someone else that can't bless, that has no blessings, that has no one pointing them to God. In fact, I'll back this up and I'll stake this point on the words of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. I think what Jesus is saying here in in relation to the sermon is according to your expectations, according to your belief that he can do things, according to your trusting in the Father, will things be done to you. So here's the bottom line. If you don't think God will do something, he's probably not going to do it. Does that make sense? But if you believe he'll do it because of his power, because he needs to he needs the world to be pointed to him so they can be saved for his glory to be spread throughout the world, he will do whatever needs to be done. To draw people to himself. And a lot of times it's just by blessing us. Isn't that a cool thing? It's a compliment to him to say, God, I expect you to take care of this. According to your will. According to your will and your glory and so people can praise you. I expect you to handle this problem. You've done it in the past and I believe you'll do it again. My trust is in you. It's a compliment to him. I love it when my boys come up to me and say, Dad, can we do something? And I'm like... In my mind, I'm like, that is radical. There's no way we can do that. My boys might come up to me, especially Declan. He'd be like, Dad, do you think us, us four boys and you can play the Chicago Bulls and have a like, pickup game sometime and do okay? I'm like, in my mind, no way. That's not possible. 
But it's a compliment to me to, for them to think that five grabers can take on the bulls. That's a compliment. In much the same way, in, in a more extreme way than ever you can imagine, it is a compliment when God's children come to the Father and say, God, can we do this for, for the family? Can we do this for the church? Can we do this for the kingdom of God? And I don't care how radical it is. It may be the fact that this church, uh, over the next 10 years, plants a church every year throughout, throughout the world, through the, the blessings that God pours on us here. And, and, you know, God's like, man, that's a big vision. Can God handle that? Absolutely. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he can. We need to start having an expectation by faith that God's going to do amazing things. When we have that type of attitude, when, when we've got this problem especially, let's say you're going through a real hard time, you're like, God, I'm in over my head, I don't know what I'm going to do, there's no way I can see a way out of this, but you've helped me before and you're going to help me again. I believe it. God loves that moment because in that moment we're saying, I trust you, God. I think in that moment God says, that a girl, that a boy, you're doing exactly what I need you to do, trust me. Remember what 2 Corinthians chapter 9 said. It says this. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. All things all the time and all that you need. Not so you can sit back and say, man, we've arrived, but so we can be about his business and his glory. Do you expect that type of thing? Can you see that? Last night, uh, after... the we had two football games in Gibson City. And by the way, the Mighty Mites of Hersher have went undefeated this year. They finished their season. They're undefeated. Let's give it a hand for the Mighty Mites. The team I coach is not so good, but they, I'm proud of them, okay? Um, and the seniors, I'm proud of you guys too. Good job this year. But after those two games, uh, we, we caught wind that Tiffany's uncle, Larry, was in a champagne hospital. And he's suffering from a lot of things, from cancer for the last 10 years, ever since I've known Uncle Larry, he has not been able to die, ingest anything through his mouth. Everything he takes into his body goes through a port in his stomach and from a bag. His cancer has totally ate up everything. He can hardly talk. And he's been in the hospital almost annually for pneumonia or from a relapse of cancer. Or uh, one time he had a severe spider bite and almost died. In the last 40 years, and I've not known Uncle Larry that long, of course, but he has struggled to say to, to just keep his life. But last night when we were with his wife, uh, Tiffany's aunt, and the four boys, and, and, and Tiffany and I were in, the, uh, in the, the room, he was putting on a good face, and, and he was talking as much as he could. The boys struggled to understand it, but Tiffany and I, can, we can understand if we really pay attention. And, and I prayed with him and, and for him. And at the end of the prayer, I prayed with the language that, Father, I expect Uncle Larry to once again recover. I know you can handle it. I I know you've done it before. And I believe you'll do it again, Lord. If it's according to your will, I pray that Uncle Larry uh, recover. And we began to talk after that prayer. And Uncle Larry says, absolutely. God's done it time and time again over the last 40 years. Why should we doubt him now? And he's really on his deathbed. I do not know what will happen to Uncle Larry in the next few days. But I believe God has the power to heal him again and again and again. Uncle Larry believes it. There will be a day when Uncle Larry, there will be a day when I, when I pass. But it's really not a bad thing. And that's why Uncle Larry has so much peace. Because he knows even if he dies, he gets to be with Jesus. But in the meantime, he's going to continue to be thankful to God for everything he has. Can you see that? Uncle Larry is expecting a miracle. And I don't even know what he's facing. I think it's pretty serious this time. Let me ask you, what are you expecting? You're not on your deathbed because you're here. What are you expecting God to do today, tomorrow, and through this next week? Just take the next week alone. Don't even think the next 10 years, the next uh, until you die. What's, what are you expecting God to do in your life that's a blessing to you and others this week? The problem is most of you aren't even thinking about it. You're like, I'm just going to go about my life this week. That's the problem. We need to be in a position where we expect God to do amazing things. We need to expect our family members who are sick to become well for God's glory. We need to expect God to bless us in a way we can bless others, whether it be with knowledge, wisdom, and occupation, or flat-out finances. We need to expect God to put us in a position to do His ministry so people will say, Praise God that I know 
those people in that church because they have led me to Jesus. But as a church and as Christians, and I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I get up on Monday morning and I'm just like, I'm just going to go about my business today. I'm going to do the things I'm supposed to do when I should really be expecting God to do something amazing. Can you see it? Remember what Jesus said, according to your faith will be done unto you. When you study the Bible, especially the New Testament, one of the coolest things I found is when God does something amazing, especially when Jesus does a miracle, it's often, and I would say, almost always connected to someone believed. Think about that. When God does a miracle, and, and when you see in the life of Jesus, when he heals somebody, when he feeds someone, whenever he sets people free from demons, it is because there's some sense of belief, um, and, and, and belief is acknowledged. Even when you think of the man who is lowered down um, into the house, his friends believe that Jesus could do it, and that's why they lowered the man in the house. And because of that belief, I believe God worked. Are you believing that God can do amazing things? Are you trusting him? Are you worried about trying to do it on your own? When you think of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, and you can study it this week, one, one place it appears is Luke chapter 12. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. He says, they don't worry about where they're going to get their food. They just kind of enjoy life. Andy, I think, has seen this already. Uh, and Daniel, I know, has a couple of times. There's this cardinal that chirps on top of the cross of the old sanctuary like every other day for a few minutes a day. And he just chirps, chirps, chirps. He's the prettiest cardinal you've, you've seen in a long time. He is just enjoying life. And, and God would say, look at that bird. He, he's not worried about what's going on. He's just doing his business. He's just carrying, carrying on his life. He says, you are much more important than any bird in the air. Don't you understand I'm going to take care of you? What are you worried about? He says, your father knows the things you need. He says, don't worry about them, trust me. And then he says these words at the end of that portion. He says, but seek God's kingdom first and all these things that you need will be added to you. They'll be given to you. Every time you worry though, and every time you say, God, I'm not sure, you're saying, God, I'm not, I don't believe you can handle this. I think I might need to worry about this myself. Every time we worry, saying, God, I, I don't trust you to handle this. We need a position where we're, we trust God for his blessings and then we put them to work when he gives them to us. Can you see it? God wants to bless you and he's saying, will you trust me? Finally this morning, one major other key point in this cycle of blessing is once you receive in Jesus and once you celebrate in Jesus and once you continue to expect it to happen, you got to share it with others. The mission of this church is to share God's love with all people everywhere. If we just receive it and celebrate, it's not enough. We've got to share it. When we receive Christ, we must, we must be ready to propel it to others. We can't just say, boy, doesn't it feel good to be blessed? It's too bad those people don't know about God's blessings. It's too bad they're going to hell. It's, we've got what we need here. We're going to sit back and eat, drink, and be merry. God says, no, we need to use the blessings to abound in every good work. And I believe one of the greatest works that we can be about is sharing his love and the truth of Jesus. Sometimes, though, we say... I don't really have all that I need yet. Tyson, I'm not in the top 8%. I'm not really that blessed. I'm a person that struggles to have a house. I'm a person that struggles to have food for my kids. I'm a person that has significant health problems. I can't be a blessing to anyone else. That's a lie. Probably, probably from Satan. God has put each of us in this room, I believe, in a position to bless others. Maybe not in the same way. Some of you cannot bless others financially, but you can bless others with your time and your caring. Some of you can't bless uh, anyone by changing a starter in their car, but you may be the person that can help them paint their living room. Each of us can be a blessing to someone else, and we don't have an excuse. You say, Tyson, I'll start to be a blessing when I get a little bit more time, whenever this bank account gets uh, a little bit more money in it, when this mortgage gets paid off, I'll start sharing what I have with others. No, it'll never happen then. You need to start sharing what you have now, And what will happen is, I believe, when you share with what you have now, God will even give you more to share. I know I found it works time and time again. Whenever I have something to offer someone else and I give it, God gives me something even greater in return almost almost immediately. 
just in this season of life when Andy, our, our new intern, is here and I'm trying to invest in him a little bit, he's been a blessing to us. Daniel has been here since January, our new youth pastor. He's been a blessing, but there are things I'm trying to share with Daniel. So I'm, I've got two guys I'm kind of pouring into. Just recently, people have come into my life to pour into me that I didn't even pursue. My question for you is maybe ask yourself, who are you helping to grow? Because when you help someone grow, I believe God time and time again will help send someone in your life to help you grow. Just yesterday, I had a breakfast with a guy who's been in ministry for 20 years. And he gave me some great advice. And I stumbled upon that. It's kind of like the... It's kind of like that movie. Is that really stumbling upon? Was that just luck? No, I believe it's God's blessings. What will you do to continue to bless others? In Acts 20, 35, it says this. Jesus says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. If you truly want to be blessed, start sharing and giving the resources you have to bless someone else. You know, this is something I grew up here. My mom say a lot of times at Christmas, she'd want me to get a present for my brother and sister and maybe someone else in the family. And I'll be like, you know, I'm not too interested in that. I think, you know, as a young man, you're like a young boy. You're like, Christmas is about receiving. And she say, uh, Christmas is it's more blessed to give than receive. And we've heard that time and time again. That's just not for Christmas. That's for today. It's for tomorrow. It's for the entire week. It's for your entire life. Jesus says it is more blessed to give than receive. Can you see it? We're looking for the next best thing. The next best thing is to share what we have. But the cool part is, and I'm not going to be beat around the bush about it, when you share what you have, it becomes such a great blessing because God blesses you even more almost immediately. So you may be wondering, how can I be a blessing to people? Once again, Tyson, I'm really not that blessed. I don't know what I could do. Well, over the next three weeks, if you've wondered that question, I encourage you to come back because the next three weeks, we're going to talk about how we can be a blessing to other people. They're going to be in very different ways. But between now and next week, as we wrap up today, I want you to consider claiming one of these three questions. And the first one is this, and this will be your homework. Ask yourself, what am I good at that I could do to help someone else to bless them? What am I good at that I could do for someone else that will bless them? Not for profit, not so my name can be glorified, just so I can bless someone else. Maybe you're a mechanic and you can help uh, a single mom uh, change their oil in her car. Maybe you're a carpenter and you can help build someone someone's house. Maybe you are very wise in scriptures and you can help someone understand the scriptures. What can you do for someone else that will be a blessing for them? And then do it. Whatever's come to your mind, if that's the question you can answer. I came across a guy in the church this about a month ago. He told me a story, and I love it. He is a carpenter. So there's more than one carpenter, so you don't know exactly who this is. But he says once a month, he goes out and bids a job, and he does it with the, with the understanding that they're going to pay him a certain amount of money when it's done. Maybe it's $3,000, maybe it's 13000 After he does this job, and, and they're ready to submit the bill and do the final walkthrough and maybe give the final bill to the person... Instead of giving them a bill, he gives them a paper once a month, somebody he picks, and he says, this project is paid in full. Once a month, this man in our church uses his ability to out of the blue bless bless somebody that he's working with. Isn't that amazing? I was like, this is cool. I'm not going to tell you his name because you would all sign up for his his work and then you'd be like, I want to be that guy. You might figure out who it is. But you know what? More than anything, I know I don't have to say his name because God is going to bless him. And he told me that story to say, the more I've been doing that, the more God has been blessing me. It's pretty amazing. What can you do for someone else to be a blessing to them? Maybe that's not one you want to answer, but maybe this is a better question for you. What do I know that I could pass on to some other person to be a blessing to them because of my experience or my knowledge? So this is a different one. What do I know that I could share with someone to bless them? For you uh, ladies who have already uh, raised your children and you've been excellent homemakers for the last 30 years, I strongly suggest for the blessings of the entire church to share your knowledge with the younger women who have children. Share the things you know with the, with the ladies that, that are learning about how to be a godly mom and how to balance a budget and, and make... Uh, Simple as this, how to, how, how to string along the, the budget for food to feed your family. Guys, 
Take time to take a young man under your wing if you've been married for a few years and tell them things not to do in marriage to stay blessed in their marriage, okay? Sometimes, guys, the greatest thing we can do is say, man, you shouldn't have done that. Never do that again. Let them know that. But ask yourself, is there something I know that I can share with someone else? Can I mentor them for God's glory? Or maybe this is a question you can answer. What do I have that I could give someone or at least loan to them that they need to bless them? Most of you maybe have something you couldn't give away, but maybe you could loan to someone. Maybe you need to be in relationships, and I'm so thankful for this. How many times Tiffany received something from one of you in your family to help her through, get through that moment? Maybe it's making applesauce, and, and she needs this one device. Maybe uh, just last week I was blessed with a, a bow and arrow set so I could go hunting with my son. I couldn't go out and buy a bow. I just bought one for my son. And somebody out of the blue gives me a bow and arrow set. Now I'm blessed. I'm so thankful for some of you guys who have given me tools to help me get through projects. Time and time again, I can go to this one guy and say, hey, can I borrow this? He's like, sure, I got that. And he'll have three of them. And, and I just need that one thing to get through the project. With that said, if I have anything I borrowed from you, please let me know. I want to give it back. <laughs> so that next time I need something, I'll be in a position where I can borrow that thing. And if you know that I have something that you need to borrow, please ask me. I'd be happy to loan it to you. What do you have that someone else could be blessed by? I hope you can answer one of those three questions. But here's the last question as we close today that I know all of you can answer. Who do I know that needs to know Jesus? I think if you do those other three things, they're going to be more apt to listen to you about Jesus. But when, when the rubber hits the road is, we do all these things, God bless us in all things, in every way, all the time, so we can point people to Jesus, so they can praise Him for what He's done in salvation. Who do you know that needs Jesus? You'd be like, Tyson, the people I know that need Jesus aren't interested in Jesus. Do you really know that, or are you just assuming that? Because it goes back to the video, the, the next best thing that you could ever be a part of is leading someone to salvation through Jesus so they can be with him forever. That's the next greatest thing that could ever happen. You say, Tyson, they're not interested at all. I, I don't know if I buy that or not. Because if they really knew what Jesus did, that they died on the cross for them, wouldn't they want to know that? Think about it. If someone died for you, wouldn't you want to know? Maybe go about it that way. Say, Jesus, you know, after you help them uh, make applesauce or you ha- teach them how to, to use a bow and arrow so they can go kill a deer, whatever you're doing, somewhere in the mix say, hey, by the way, did you know I followed Jesus because he died for me and he died for you? Don't people deserve to know Jesus died for them? It goes back to that eternal destination problem. Maybe you know a hypochondriac that doesn't know Jesus. You can say, I'm really concerned you have an EDP. And they're like, what's that? You can say, you have an eternal destination problem, and God has the answer. His name's Jesus. Can you see it? God has blessed us in so many ways, but we assume it's our right. God wants us to be a blessing to others through Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today and your word. God, I, I pray that in the middle of the mess of this life, that we receive Jesus and we become blessed by him. God, help us to celebrate his blessing. Help us to rejoice in it. Help us to begin to share it with others even more. God, if there's someone here today that needs to receive Jesus so they can celebrate and they can be blessed, I pray they come forward and begin to trust him like never before. God, if someone just needs to do that right where they're at, I pray that they make that decision and begin to pursue you. And I pray, you, I pray that you would let them see your blessings that, that come after that. Lord, we know in this earth we're going to have trouble. But you've promised you're greater than the trouble of this world. And we thank you for that. In your son's name, I pray. Amen.